Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi So we're going to be continuing with our review series. Inshallah, I'll be talking about um, stage four, continuing on, but now talking about the four great imams. Okay, so the first um, madhahab we'll talk about is Abu Hanifa. So he was born before any of the other four great madhahab, and he was born during the time of the Umayyad dynasty and then passed away during the time of the Abbasids. He um, was like third generation Muslim. His grandfather originally embraced Islam. He was actually born during the time of some of the Sahaba, but it's a little bit unclear as to whether or not he actually met them. And this is something that people often debate about, but it's really not important for our understanding of him. Um, so he, let's see, some of his more prominent teachers were Hamad ibn Abi Sulaiman. He, and then also another gentleman named Ibrahim al nakhai was also one of the lead teachers of Abu Hanifa. And um, Ibrahim al nakhai was also one of the founders of the Iraqi school of thought. And so as a result, Abu Hanifa used to, had a lot of influence from the Iraqi school of thought, which in turn was influenced by the Persian school of thought, which put a lot of emphasis on reason uh, over just a literalist interpretation. And so he used to actually favor fuqaha over muhaddithin. Um, so some people, um, some of his famous students in turn are, are people that are people named Abu Yusuf al-Qadi who was a prominent judge and then also Muhammad bin Hassan al-Shaybani. So a lot of people ask why Abu Hanifa's opinions were often very different from other madhab and, and the answer is because um, he was first of all alive before the other three so he some his opinions were not influenced by some of the thing, same things that the other three madhahib were influenced by. Um, let's see, and then also because he was influenced by the Iraqi school of thought, which others weren't necessarily. Next, we will move on to Imam Malik. He was sort of the next chronological uh, madhahib. He was originally from Yemen. He was born during the Umayyad period and then um, died during the time of Harun al-Rashid. So he is also known as someone that was a great muhaddithin and he was so devoted to the sunnah that he really took that hadith to heart that said Medina is, the, is better for you if only you knew. And so as a result, he was born in Medina and he lived there his entire life in order to be loyal to that hadith. He is most famous uh, for his book Al Mu'atta, which literally means the paved path, and so referring of the, obviously to the path of knowledge, it was actually written uh, by this after the suggestion of Abu Jafar al Mansur, who suggested that they make it into a state law, but then um, he said that it wasn't complete, and so it ended up not becoming a state law. But it became a very influential book that many people studied from, nonetheless. Um, so he was also a teacher of Imam Shafi'i who read his book and then came to meet Imam Malik to study from him. Um, during his time, one of the most one of the more prominent events is that the Abbasids used to, when they took over power from the Umayyads, they threatened people and said that if people didn't pledge allegiance to them, then they would be like divorcing their wives. And so people were obviously very concerned about this and they came to Imam Malik asking if this was actually valid and he told them that no, that's not valid, that won't. If you don't pledge allegiance to them, it's not going to divorce you from your wife. And so as a result, uh, the main people in, the, in power, um, unfortunately, uh, tortured him for having this opinion. And they beat him. The principles of Imam Malik. So he was, like I said, a muhaddithin. And so um, he thought that whatever became popular in Medina, where he lived, must have roots in the sunnah. He, however, did not strictly adhere to his own usul, and some, sometimes if there was a popular opinion, even if there wasn't very obvious evidence for it, he would be willing to kind of explore the validity of it. He was also an advocate of, in general, of like blocking things that might lead to haram. So if there was some kind of activity that they, he thought would lead to haram, he would just, he would um, tend to block it if it was a means to evil. He was also very critical, and unlike Abu Hanifa, he was critical of Ar Ra'i, which is the Iraqi school of thought that emphasizes a lot of reason. And then, um, so areas that follow hit the Maliki school are like North and West Africa, and then also Western Europe due to the migration of the North Africans there. And then um, they also took over the Awza'i Madhab in And Andalus. Okay, next is Imam um, Ash Shafi'i. He was actually of the bloodline of, of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu He was born in Gaza. His father passed away and then his mom took him to Mecca where he grew up. So he grew up speaking a very pure dialect of Arabic and was considered an authority in the Arabic language as a result. 
he initially received Imam Malik's book, the Muatta in Mecca, memorized it, and then went to Medina in order to study with Imam Malik himself. When he was young, he became a governor in Yemen. Um, unfortunately, some people became upset about this and started spreading rumors that he was supporters of al-Alawi, and this was not true, so he was eventually uh, declared innocent by this, but he suffered from it. Um, he then, so he was taken to uh, Baghdad where he was interrogated about this accusation and then they eventually found him innocent but he decided to stay on in Baghdad in order to meet with the students of Imam Malik and study with them there. He, uh, so he traveled from Baghdad back to Mecca and then he traveled back to Baghdad where he met a new scholar, Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, and, who became his student later on as well. The Rasul of Imam Shafi'i, he um, thought that Hadith and Quran were on the same level, which is in contrast to uh, Imam Abu Hanifa, who thought that Quran was above Hadith and authority. He also thought that Fard and Wajib were interchangeable, which is again different from Abu Hanifa. He used to prefer statements of Sahaba over analogies. He, um, some of his main criticisms is that he was very strict, and especially in devotional acts, his fiqh was very, very strict. He. Um, he used to work on his book. His book was called Al-Risala, and he used to constantly change it, but then he felt like he could never perfect it, which we talked about in class. He, he once said that, you know, Allah wouldn't allow any book but his own to be made perfect. So areas that follow him are rather widespread. So Southeast Asia, East Africa, Yemen, Amman, uh, and South India, Asham, and then Central Asia and South Africa. The next Imam in line is Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal. So he was born in Baghdad. He um, he was really influenced by his mom. Uh, the you know, Sheikh Yasser Bijas told us a story of how his mom used to take him to Fajr even when he was a baby, and so that he could be in that presence. Um, he was born during the golden era of the Abbasid dynasty. <clears throat> He also became a Khalifa at the time that uh, the, the people adopted the Mutazila theology, which is the theology that was like based on that sort of promoted reason over revelation. And so it was like a little bit um, radical in that it's even said that the, the Quran was like a creation of Allah, not Allah's word itself. And so it was a very, um, very uh, unpopular idea with many of the scholars. And so a lot of scholars actually refuted this theology, and uh, Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal was one of these people, and so unfortunately as a result he was tortured, and he actually spent about 28 months in and out of prison because of his stance on that um, theology. So some of his rasul, he was known to be a little bit less systematic than the others, in part because he was ultimately a muhaddithin, and so he would often share different opinions on the same issue based on different hadith. Um, however, after his after his lifetime, his students reorganized his work and made it into a more organized school of thought. He was also anti-ra'i or, or the reason um, methodology and believed that it would lead to fitna, so he preferred to be more literalist. He used to accept a weak hadith over an analogy and he uh, would say that all the sahaba were equal in terms of authority. Um, he, some of it, two of his sons actually were some of his most prominent students named Saleh and Abdullah, I believe, uh, and they collected a lot of his work. They used to um, write down his answers to questions and then publish, him, publish those as a resource for others. Some of his criticism is that he was one of the strictest madhabs. People often joke about Ahad Bali being the most strictest, and uh, most of his followers are in Saudi Arabia today. Lastly, we have a fifth madhab, the Zahiri madhab. This is also a very literalist madhab. It was initially founded by Dawud ibn Ali al-Zahiri and then received by Ali ibn Ahmed ibn Said ibn Hazm al-Andalusi. So some of his students became known as al-Hazmiya as a result of that. <clears throat> so Imam um, al-Zahiri, he grew up very wealthy. He actually was in a palace as the son of a minister. And he used to say like, I used to, that I grew up under golden chandeliers and yet I still devoted my life towards attaining knowledge. He became a minister twice for the Umayyads and he also lived during the period of power struggle and during the Umayyad period. He used to um, promote a lot of free thinking some of his principles is that he was known to be very, very strict and very literalist. He was against uh, 
Pliyas, and um, which is like the the methodology of deductive analogies, and thought that the text itself had enough hukum, so he was very literal to it. Uh, he also was against the culture of taqlid, which is the uncritical following of scholarships. So an example of his literalist um, opinions is that there's a hadith that says that if uh, there's water that has been urinated and then it's contaminated, and he used to believe that um, it would only be contaminated if somebody directly urinated into that water. So if, for example, somebody urinated into a cup and then poured it into the water, it would not be considered najis because of how literally he interpreted that hadith. And so this was obviously very different from other people who would um, interpret this hadith in more broad terms as meaning that any urine that touched it would make it uh, contaminated. Unfortunately, he was hated by a lot of his people for a long time, but then did have some followers as well. Um, he, one of his strengths is that he was known as an encyclopedia of knowledge, he used to memorize all of his works. Um, and then the people, some of the people that followed his methodology became known as Ahl Hadith. Lastly, I just wanted to touch on the concept of Khilaf and Ikhtilaf, which is disagreements and differences of opinion. So there's different categories of this. Um, that we talked about in class. First of all, there's acceptable versus unacceptable differences. So there's some issues that there are not any, um, there's not any room for debate. So for example, like when you talk about the impermissibility of zina or the obligation of fasting during Ramadan, these are so well known and established that you can't debate them. And so it's unacceptable to have different opinions on these kinds of issues. Whereas other issues are more um, sort of open to different opinions. And then also there's diverse and contradictory opinions. So there's some things where you can have diverse opinions and they can both be valid, but if there's, they're contradicting each other, then that can cause a problem. So for example, there's a lot of sunnah actions during salah that are diverse and they don't contradict one another. So all of them are potentially valid. But if there are two opinions that exactly contradict each other, then one of them has to be wrong. Okay, so then we also touched on the reasons for differences of opinion. So there are numerous, as you can imagine. So one of the biggest things are differences in humans. So this can be as a result of different levels of knowledge or exposure to resources or their openness to ijtihad um, or, you know, their, their upbringings or different influences on the people themselves. Other uh, reasons are political differences. So whether or not the state uh, has supported a particular school of thought or not can can really influence different opinions. And then differences over textual proofs. So um, this can vary based on the availability of different hadith to different groups of people. Interpretational differences. So some people um, sort of agree on evidences but sort of disagree on the interpretation. So an example is that <clears throat> Um, we're told that touching the opposite gender breaks your wudu, and some people take this literally, meaning that if you touch somebody, then that automatically breaks your wudu, whereas other people think of it as more of an analogy um, to a more intimate type of touch. And then difference over juristic methods, again, differences in methodology um, can lead to different opinions as well. Great, so that brings us to the conclusion of this uh, era. Inshallah, next time we'll talk about stage five. Assalamu alaikum wa